الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dearest brothers and sisters in Islam I received a a message from a, a brother and I'm just going to read that message out to you Assalamu alaikum tawfiq bhai this is my probably my last message to you as I lie here waiting for my last breath to go away this is probably the last time I'm going to be able to write to anyone and I thought I'd write to you so that perhaps when you teach your classes and when you give your lectures you can remind people of this last lecture of mine you have known me for a long time I've just been a very basic Muslim tried to do my prayers tried to fast whenever Ramadan would come tried to say my salah did Hajj once in my life yeah I had children but never really looked after them I had a wife she wasn't the most righteous person I never really really chose because of that and my children grew up not knowing much about Islam and as I wait here for the bell to go off as my life will end dying of pancreatic cancer of which the doctors have said I cannot survive beyond this week as I wait for the angel of death I have only one word that comes in my mind and that is regret I just have this tremendous regret that there's so many things I wanted to do you know I wanted to memorize the Quran and never did so I wanted to go for Hajj every year but I never did that I wanted to hug my mother but I never did that I wanted to teach my children Islam the Quran get them to be righteous people but I never did that I wanted to have the chance to have one more Ramadan but I'll never get that I wish I could be in Haram now but I'll never get that chance I wish I could know some verses of the Quran to recite but I don't know anything except the Fatiha and one or two other surahs that I recite every day all I can think of is huge regret no one will remember me except you and perhaps my own family if they have time before they divide up my wealth my friends have left me my family will not remember me I will have left nothing in this world of good and by Allah all I will have done is just added another grave on this earth I am your brother your Muslim brother Muhammad my brothers my sisters in Islam I received a lot of messages like that not all of them are from people who are about to die but certainly the common theme of every single person that I have spoken to that come to the end of their life and they have not done what they really should be doing and they should be persisting on doing it's this common word called regret they are full of regret by Allah I wish I had done this I wish I had done that I wish I would do that I wish I could have done so much but subhanallah they have forgotten that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them a tremendous life full of wealth full of time full of youth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them that opportunity by Allah yet they never really took it my brothers and my sisters in Islam this message that I read for you is from a patient of mine in the hospital Gold Coast Hospital subhanallah this is a brother that I used to know that accepted Islam many many years back a new Muslim 
However, he never really practiced Islam. He never really studied, never really learned. He never really did much with his life except that he just led his life like the vast majority of us. How many of us can remember someone who, has not, who is not alive today, this Ramadan? Can anyone remember somebody? Put up your hands. Can you remember someone, one person at least? The someone that you remember, wallahi, that has not attended? I can see a couple of brothers of mine, subhanAllah, I haven't seen for a long time. Amir, mashallah, I thought I'd never see you. I'm sure you can remember people. I'm sure, Jazeer, you can remember people that perhaps we saw last Ramadan and we will never see this Ramadan. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, we don't have to worry about the Day of Judgment. We really don't. Because ultimately, it's the grave that is the first position before the Day of Judgment. Uthman radiallahu anhu used to say, what worries me is not the Akhirah. What worries me is not Jahannam and the Day of Judgment. What worries me is my first night in the grave. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, the first night in the grave is the worst night. It is the night where our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promised and he swore by Allah saying the following. What did he say? He said, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ It has been revealed to me. This is an authentic hadith in Bukhari. He said, by Allah, it has been revealed to me. أَنَّكُمْ سَتُفْتَنُونَ فِي قُبُورِكُمْ That you will all be tested in your graves. قَرِيبٌ أَوْ مِثْلَ قَرِيبٍ مِنْ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالِ that you will all have the test and the punishment and the pain and the sorrow of something similar to the fitna and the test and the trial of the Dajjal. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is irrelevant whether Dajjal will meet him in this world or not. The same level of trial will come to us in the grave. And that is on the very first night. On the very first night, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is when we will feel the reality of the grave. My friends, everyone thinks that death is easy. I swear by Allah, I don't know where this comes from. Death is never easy. Death is never easy. I've never found a patient of mine that just passes away in peace. I've never found one patient pass away in peace. They're always gurgling at the end of their death. We have to give them hyoscine bromide, a medicine to stop their gurgling as they're passing away. Do you know why? Because of the secretions in their voice, we give the hyoscine bromide, which is a, a drug that basically decreases the secretions in their throat. Because we can hear them gurgling and it's very disturbing. It's very disturbing. So anyone who is passing away chronically, from anything chronic, acutely of course, someone who just dies straight away, heart attack, that you don't hear anything. You don't hear how they're dying. But people who are passing away slowly, like from cancer or from heart disease that is prolonged, they die a terrible death. I have never seen one patient of mine who dies an easy death. The Prophet wasallam said in authentic hadith, Verily death has its trials, verily death has its pain. Verily death has its trial and verily death has its pain. Do not ever, ever think that you're going to have an easy death somehow. Oh, you should have seen him. He passed away so peacefully. What are you talking about? How do you know he passed away peacefully? When our Prophet ﷺ, who knew the truth said, verily death has its pain, verily death has its trials. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and we are in our third of our five different stages first allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conceived of us in his knowledge secondly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in the womb of our parents third stage in this world the fourth will be in the grave and the fifth will be in the hereafter the eternity of the hereafter now guess what guys with this life of 70 years, we're going to have to purchase our hereafter. With this life of 60 or 70 years, and a prophet said that, my ummah will live for 60 or 70 years, authentic hadith in Bukhari. You won't live beyond that. Yes, one or two of us might successfully live till 80 or 90 or 100, very rare. 
But because you're a Muslim, and because your cultural practices, your food practices are quite similar, you will probably die at the age of 60 or 70 or maximum 80 if we can keep you alive by some mercy from Allah. But by Allah, you won't live beyond that. How many of you are already 40, 50 years old? I am 35. I know I have less than probably 10, 20 years before my bones start aching, before my, my chest starts hurting, because my breath becomes difficult, before traveling becomes unbearable, before I need more sleep, before I have to take three or four pills every day to just keep my body healthy. I know I have only 10, 15 years of productivity in my life left. I have only 15 years to do something for this dunya. I have only 15 years, if Allah doesn't give me death before that, I have only 15 years by Allah, before which I must make my mark, I must leave a legacy on this world. Is there anyone amongst you who has that feeling as well? This feeling that, you're, that your life is ending, and that by Allah you will not have that chance ever again. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, I swear by Allah, as Allah is my Lord, I have not seen a single patient of mine except that they have regret. Every one of them. I remember this old man, 70 years old, German national, living in Australia. And the man was so frail. Every three, every three, four days we would make him better and then he would come again with some infection or some disease. And I was like, come on man, just go to a nursing home, I used to tell him. So he used to say, but you guys look after me better than a nursing home. Nursing home, the nurse is just going to give me medicine, feed me, whatever, and then just going to put me. What happened to your child? My child doesn't look after me anymore. Where is he? He's discovered some girl and they've run off. So do you have anybody? No one at all. Then I tried to comfort him and I said, you know what? It's all right, mate. You've had a good life. You know how we say in Australia? <laughs> We've had a good life. You've had a good innings, we say. We had a good innings, good set of games. He said, but I don't want to die. Why not? Because there's nothing after it. Nothing after it. So this man is in this deep depression. Deep depression because there's nothing else after it. And for each one of us, my brothers and sisters in Islam, are we of those people who also think this is nothing after it? Or are we of those people who think that by Allah there is so much tremendous blessings after it? The Prophet ﷺ promised us, promised us, out of every 1,000 people, 999 will go to Jahannam. He said in the authentic hadith in Muslim, out of every 1,000 people, 999 will go to Jahannam. According to one report, some of the scholars said, according to one report, that this refers to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And other scholars, such as Ibn Hajar and others, said no. This refers to every single human being, Muslim and non-Muslim. Out of every 1,999 will go to Jahannam. And if they don't go to Jahannam, they will be thrown into it only to be taken out. But every, every 999 out of every 1,000 will go to Jahannam. Do you know in the authentic hadith in Bukhari, a man stood up from the Sahaba. Sahaba, right? Everyone, Sahaba. You know who the Sahaba are? They are the best of the best, right? As-sabiqoon, as right? Yes or no? Sahaba stood up. On that Friday, and the Prophet was giving a talk. And the Prophet said, Today you will not ask me about anything except that I will tell you. So the Sahaba stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, where is my place in, in the hereafter? Where will I be? What do you think the Prophet said? In the authentic hadith in Bukhari, he said, Jahannam. Your place will be the Jahannam. This was to a prophet of his. This was to a Sahaba of his. Are we deluding ourselves? Wallahi, are we deluding ourselves, brothers and sisters? Are we thinking that we are going to be going to go to some really great place. Like those two people in Surah Kaf that Allah talks about. Have you heard of the story of Surah Kaf, those two people? 
One of them who Allah had given a huge bustan, a huge bustan, a huge garden. It was an amazing garden. Because the garden, Allah says in Surah Kahf, that that garden gave its fruits twice a year, not once a year like every garden, but twice a year. It was so amazing that it was a garden between which a river flowed, surrounded by date palm trees, watered by Allah and provided water by that beautiful river that ran in between the garden. It was so amazing that he would enter his garden and he used to say what? Ma hadi abada. I don't think this will ever finish. And then he used to say, Walaw irditu ila rabbi, and if I go back to Allah, la ajidanna khayran minha munqalaba, I will find better than this. But Allah, there is no single human being amongst us except things like this, unfortunately. How many of us think like this? Wow, look at the wealth Allah has given us. Allah really must love me. And really, even if I were to die now, I think Jannah will be even better for me. The Hurul Ain are waiting for me. Jannah, Jannah is waiting for me. This is what we feel in our heart. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, if Jannah is waiting for you, ask Allah for death right now. If you think you're going to Jannah, ask Allah for death right now. Ask Allah for death. Ask Allah for death right now. If you're truthful, but you are lying to yourself. You don't believe it in your heart. If you believe it in your heart, ask Allah for death right now. Allah challenges the Jews in the Quran. Because the Jews are the ones who think that they are going to go to Jannah automatically as soon as they die. Allah says, Qul al mawta in kuntum sadiqeen. Say to them, O Muhammad Wasallam, ask Allah for death if indeed you are truthful. Ask Allah for death, my brothers and sisters of Islam. Rather, each and every one of us knows we have not earned Jannah yet. Each and every one of us knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not written Jannah for us yet. We cannot have that guarantee as yet. We know that in our heart. Verily, mankind is ever a witness over himself, even if he gives excuses. We ourselves, our own souls, are enough a witness over our own actions and deeds. We don't need anyone else to tell us. We don't need the book to tell us. We know what we have done. We know how much we have done and how little we, of good we have left on this earth. We know this, my friends. This is why we don't dare to ask for death. This is why we are afraid of doing anything that might speed up our death. Because we are afraid we have not earned Allah's mercy as yet. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, what if this is your last Ramadan? What if this is your last Ramadan? What will you do? If these days were the last days of Ramadan that you'd ever have, the last Laylatul Qadr, how would you spend it? My brothers and my sisters in Islam, is there anyone amongst us except that he feels empty in his heart? That there is something that he, that, that he still needs to do? Some Quran that he wants to memorize, some people that he needs to help, some excuse that he needs to earn in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there anyone amongst us except that we must feel like this? My brothers and my sisters in Islam, the problem with all of us is because of the world that we live in. It is because that although we are meant to have the world in our hands, unfortunately it is now in our hearts. The same world that we are meant to control has now entered and crept through our veins directly into our hearts until it is part and parcel of our hearts. Do you know what the pious predecessors used to say? They used to say that the love of this world and the love of the hereafter are like two scales in the heart of a believer. When one side of the scale becomes heavy, the other side becomes light. And when the other side becomes heavy, the other one becomes light. If you love the hereafter, you will love this dunya less. And you, if you love this world, you will love the akhirah less. And by Allah, you only need one example to prove which one you love more. Shall I give you a test which you will all show me how exactly how much you love this world? And by Allah, this is the test of Sufyan al-Thawri. Sufyan al-Thawri said, if you want to ask somebody how much they love this world compared to the hereafter, then ask them how much food do they cook when a rich man comes to their house compared to when a poor man comes to their house. 
يا سلام والله والله this one hurt me hit me like a knife in my heart how truthful was Sufyan al-Thawri isn't it true brothers how much do you cook when you know someone wealthy is coming doesn't matter whether you're gonna get food from him money from him or not wealthy oh my he must be really wealthy when you know what wife cook chicken and rice and meat and fish make sure there's three or four dishes a poor guy is coming it's all right it's all right don't have to cook that much it's one one dish is enough just one biryani that's enough that's enough how much do we love this world every one of us i'm sure will answer every one of us will show surely answer that by allah if a rich man comes to a house we cook more food isn't that right let's be truthful i want to see a show of hands how many people i will put my, the first person to put my hand that i would have cooked more if a rich man came come on show me your hands truthful be truthful wallahi be truthful now the first position before you rectify yourself is to recognize a mistake recognize there is a fault okay this is 50 percent of rectifying an error is to first of all recognize that we're mistaken that by Allah unfortunately we love this dunya too much we've become too attached to it we judge people according to it we value people according to how much they've achieved and we love this dunya too much to love the hereafter and this is what is shackling us to this world my brothers and my sisters in Islam ask yourself a second question and that second question is this how many of you can 100% say Allah is happy with me now how many of you are sure Allah is happy with you right now how many of you are sure that you have definitely done a deed for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever punish you how many of you can do that I'm telling you no one can no one amongst us if you are sure about this that you have you might as well you might as well just die because that's the best state to be in Allah is happy with you just die right now brother ask Allah for death straight away but by Allah there is no one amongst us who can guarantee that my brothers, my sisters, Islam, this question of Allah being happy with us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanting Jannah for us is a question that must come to every one of our minds. The greatest of the Sahaba, the greatest of the Sahaba were those people who used to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much. The greatest of the Sahaba were the ones who were truly worried that this would be their last Ramadan. It was reported that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to say that I wish I was a twig that was cut off and eaten up. A twig of a tree that was cut off and eaten up. And this is Abu Bakr, the one who was promised Jannah. And it was Umar radiallahu anhu when he read the verse in the Quran, Wa in minkum illa wa riduha. There is no one amongst you except that he is heading for it. Heading for what? Jahannam. According to the tafsir of Ibn Abbas that he fell into a coma for one month. It was the Sahaba, Aisha radiallahu anha, and this is for the sisters in Islam. So listen, sisters. It was, the Aisha, it was Aisha radiallahu anha, who Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu reported that I passed by the hut of Aisha after the sun had risen and Fajr had, fi had finished. Sun had risen and 10 minutes after sun rising, Aisha had started her salah. And she was reciting the verse of the Quran. Do you know what verse she was reciting? فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ And Allah had blessed us and Allah forgave us and Allah, Allah saved us from the terrible torment. And she was crying. And then I went to do all my day-to-day -day work. And I finished my day-to-day -day work around Dhuhr time before the Dhuhr Adhan. I came around towards the masjid and I found Aisha still reciting the same verse and she was still crying and Allah blessed us had mercy on us and he saved us from the terrible fire my brothers and my sisters in Islam 
There is no one amongst us here except that Allah has already written our name for Jannah or Jahannam. No one. No one amongst us except Allah has already put our place for Jannah or Jahannam. Already. You know that. Believe that. This is what our Prophet said so. The Prophet ﷺ said when, he, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings, He created a group. And he said, I've created this group for Jannah. And then he separated another group. And he said, I've created this group for Jahannam. And when Malik bin Dinar, one of the great Sahaba, one of the great Tabi'een, he read about this hadith. It was reported that he used to pray every single night, standing up at night and he would grab his beard like this. And he would say, Oh Allah, I know you have created people for Jannah and Jahannam. I know you've already decreed who is going to go to Jannah and who will go to Jahannam. Oh Allah, tell me which group am I from? Oh Allah, tell me which group am I from? My brothers and my sisters in Islam, if this was your last Ramadan, how would you spend it? What would you do? If tomorrow the doctor came to you and said, you have terminal cancer. And you will not live more than three months. And by Allah, I do this all the time. When I was in oncology, the worst thing for me as a junior doctor was having to call patients and say they're about to die. They always left the junior doctors to do the dirty job. Unfortunately, I was the one who had to counsel patients that they're going to die. I was the one who had to tell them that we have to cut off half their body, otherwise they'll die. We have to cut their liver out, we have to cut their pancreas out, which might cut their tummy for which they'll never be able to eat properly, which will have to feed them with a tube for the rest of their life, which is going to be six months maximum anyway. Do they want that to happen? My brothers, my sisters, Islam, I'm not joking about this. There are so many Muslims and non-Muslims, all of them suffering from all of this. The statistics show that one in four people will die of cancer. So one of four of you will die of cancer. So the statistics also show one in three people will die of heart failure and heart disease. So one of three of you, one of three of you, if not you, if not you, then you. If not you, if not you, then you. One of three of you will die because your heart will fail. And you'll have a tremendous pain in your chest and you will die from that. Statistics show that one in five of you, so that's cancer is one in four, heart failure and heart disease is one in three. Statistics show that one in six of you will die from a serious infection because of some other underlying disease. One in six. So if not you, 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 then you. So choose which way you're going to die. It's always going to be something not bad, not good. Not going to be pleasant. Someone who has a serious disease, like heart failure, probably has kidney failure. Towards the end of their life, by the last two or three years, they're not allowed to drink much water. I have an auntie who's dying of heart failure. The problem with her is she cannot drink more than a cup of tea. If she drinks more than a cup of tea, then she ends up with more water and goes to her lungs and she is <gasps> dying of breath, as if she is dying of drowning. So one in four of you will die like that. One in three of you will die from tremendous pain. And because there will be so much pain in your body, so much pain, we're going to give you drugs. What drugs? We're going to give you a lot of morphine and hyoscine bromide. The, th the thing that will stop you from gur gurgling all the time. The gurgling of death as Allah calls it. And we're going to give you a lot of diazepam. What is that? It's just to keep you completely sedated like you are a majnoon. So one in three of you will die like that. You will never have the chance to say La ilaha illallah. You know, people are going to remember this talk and say, oh, that guy was scaring us. I probably am. But I'm only telling you the truth. I'm only telling you the truth. One out of two of you will never have the chance to say, La ilaha illallah at the time of death. I swear by Allah, you won't. How do I know? Because the people who die of heart failure, and people who die of cancer, which if you add them all together, will approximately equate to half the people of you here. If you're dying of heart failure, you will die from either one of two ways. Sudden heart attack, 
suddenly heart attack, you will not have the energy to even say anything. Sudden pain from which you'll go down on the earth and you'll just die. Okay? Or it'll be a very, very bad death of water in your lungs, so you'll be breathing very hard. This is the one way of dying. You will never have the chance to say La ilaha illallah. No, you will not. The second type of person is someone who is dying of cancer. That person will die because of, of a lot of drugs that we are giving you. And because of drugs we're trying to keep you comfortable away from the pain, the drugs will put you to sleep and you'll be in, in constant coma until you die. So one in two of you will never have the chance to say La ilaha illallah. You won't. Medically speaking, there's no way, no way you'll have a chance. The only chance you have, my brother and my sister in Islam, is for you to say it now. Only chance is to say it now, to make that change now. If this was your last Ramadan, this is the time to do it. The problem is, my friends, this world that we live in, do you know what the pious predecessors they said? They said, beware of the magic of this world. For indeed, the magic of this world is worse than the magic of Harut and Marut. Where the magic of Harut and Marut, the two angels sent to Babylon, was to do with magic that was separate between the husband and his wife. The magic of this world separates between a slave and his Lord. Ya Salam. And in Dubai, we must feel that. How beautiful is this world? Fantastic, amazing. Dunya in its amazing glory. Even the non-Muslims are surprised when they come to this country. Amazing. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, this has the potential of taking us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has. How many of us truly have connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many of us truly can confidently say, by Allah, there is no more anything that I can do if I know death is tomorrow? Or are you of those people who can say, definitely I can do more? If you're of those people who say, I can definitely do more, then you know what the answer is. Do it now. There is no good time to give sadaqah. The time is now. There is no good time to start praying. The time is now. There is no good time to read the Quran. Time is now. There is no good time to start memorizing the Quran. The time is now. There is no good time to, to look after orphans. The time is right now. There is no good time to call your mom and say sorry. The time is right now. Call her now and say, Mom, I'm sorry. Mom, forgive me, Mom. There is no good time to say to your friend that you have blemished and harmed. I'm sorry, my friend. The time is right now. There is no good time at all, my friends. The time is right now. The time must be now. Because by Allah, we don't know when we're going to live and when we're going to die. And my friends, the thing that we must be worried about is the next deed that we do. The very next deed that we do will be our end. Because you see, there is one hadith of Rasulullah that gives tremendous hope. At the same time, it gives tremendous fear. One hadith that is amazing. It causes tremendous hope in the heart, but it causes tremendous fear at well, as well. What is that hadith? That hadith is a hadith that says, Verily actions are by its ending. It's a hadith that causes me to have tremendous fear, yet tremendous hope from Allah. Tremendous hope that if I can do a good deed next, it might be my last. And so, alhamdulillah, my, my last deed was the best deed. And so, alhamdulillah, Allah will remember me by my, by my last thing. I'll be raised up on my last thing. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbi. But it causes me tremendous fear that if I go back and I haven't learned anything, if I go back and I don't change, if I go back and I go back to my last routine that I, that I was on, it may be my death comes to me when I'm just an average Muslim. And that is it. My actions are judged by my average being that average Muslim on the last point of my death. That's the fear. The fear is, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. The hope is also that it doesn't matter what happened in the past. The fear is that it matters the sin that you're going to do. The hope is also that be idhnillah, the next good deed that you're going to do will be your final ending. That is the real fear and that is the real hope. 
Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah, he says an nuniya He says, Wallahi ma akhshad dhunuba fa innaha la'ala sabil al-afwi wal-ghufrani walakinna ma akhsha in silakhu hadha al-qalbi min tahkim al-wahyi wal-Qur'ani Wallahi, I don't fear my past deeds, my past sins for indeed I've repented to Allah and Allah loves to repent Allah loves to forgive However, what I fear is that in the very next deed that I do my heart will cease to command by this Quran and by this revelation. That's the real fear. The real fear is that the very next thing that you do will be your last deed and that will be how your death is sealed. That's the real fear, my friends. And that nothing that you have done in the past will ever matter. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi, there is no one amongst you except that he will do good deeds all his life. And that which has been written will overtake him, so he will do some bad deed, and then he will have his death, and that will be his Jahannam. And there is no one amongst you who will do bad deeds all their life. And then before he dies, he will do one good deed, and at that point his death will come, and so he will go to Jannah. This is the fear, and this is the hope as well. This is the hadith of fear, the hadith of hope. So my dearest brothers and my sisters in Islam, if you knew that this is your last Ramadan, what would you do? Wouldn't you love to leave a legacy on this earth? Wouldn't you love to die knowing Allah is happy with you? Wouldn't you love to die knowing that there is nothing that you can conceivably think that you are actually doing a proper sin? Wouldn't you love to, to die in a state where you are completely at peace? Because you see, it doesn't matter. There is no two, there is no more position in the hereafter. There's only two places you can go to. It's clear. There is no five places, ten places, three places. No, there's only one of two places. Either Jannah or Jahannam, that's it. You're either going to go clearly to Jannah or you're clearly going to Jahannam. And if you haven't earned enough to go to Jannah, you're definitely going to Jahannam. And what is amazing is sometimes when I hear Muslims that talk about Jahannam is only for a small amount of time. It's like, ooh. You know when you touch something hot, it's like, ooh. Is that what you think Jahannam is going to be like? Allah is going to dip you in, just take you out? Is that what you think it's like? I once asked my Shaykh, Shaykh, how long is the minimum time of Jahannam? Is there any evidence in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the minimum time of Jahannam for anyone that has done a deed that is destined to go to Jahannam? Minimum time duration. So our Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon his name, was Abdullah at Tuwajiri. He was an encyclopedia of Tafsir. We used to call him the encyclopedia. So he said, Tawfiq, I've never ever read a minimum position except one verse in the Quran. In Surah Naba, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the minimum position or the minimum time that has ever been reported in any hadith or any verse of the Quran. What is that, what is that verse? Inna jahannam kanat mirsada what did he say? He said, Inna Jahannam kanat mirsada. Verily, Jahannam is a mirsad, a place of ambush. A place for those people, those people who have been evil and sinful, a place of ambush for them. A place of dwelling for those people who have been sinful in this earth. Then Allah says, La bithina fiha ahqaba. Ya salam. They will dwell therein for ahqaba. So our Shaykh said, Ahqaba comes from the word haqab. Haqab, as Al Hassan Al Basri rahimullah said, Al Haqab is 1000 million years from our time. So the least duration Allah has ever mentioned in the Quran is ahqaba plural of haqab and a haqab is 1000 million years of our time my brothers and my sisters in islam allah is amazing in his reward but he is very serious in his punishment allah is very serious in his punishment very serious you've got to remember allah is the one who created jahannam you've got to remember allah created fire that can be so hot you've got to remember Allah can punish people very very seriously 
Have you seen anyone mangled up in a car crash? I see them all the time being in the emergency department. Someone mangled up in a car crash, completely smashed up. So subhanallah, look at how Allah, Allah gave that trial to that person. Subhanallah. And you think if this is the punishment in this world or a trial in this world, only Allah knows what it can be in the hereafter. So my beloved brothers and my sisters in Islam, if these words are not enough to move you into action and into change, then by Allah, you are a very, very difficult person to change. And may Allah have mercy on you because these words are not strong enough to change you. But perhaps the following will be enough to change you. And that is knowing how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares. And knowing how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be different. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic hadith. He said, Man ahabba liqa Allah ahabba Allah liqa'ah. Wa man kariha liqa Allah kariha Allah liqa'ah. Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. And whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, if the fear of Allah is not enough to move you to action, then let the mercy of Allah be enough to move you to action. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuhal insan, O mankind, Ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. What has taken you away from your Lord Most High? What has taken us away, my brothers, my sisters, Islam, from the Lord who has given us so much blessings? Fabi ayyi ala yu rabbi kuma tukadiban. Which of the blessings of Allah will you deny, my friends? How can you disbelieve and sin against Allah? When you were dead, Allah gave you life. Then He will give you death and then He will raise you up again. And you will come back to Allah. My brothers, my sisters in Islam, Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and his love. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimullah, he said, I would never ever replace Allah with my parents on the day of judgment as my judge. I would rather have Allah judge me rather than my parents. Because I know Allah loves me far, than my, than, far more than my own parents. How amazing is this statement of Sufyan al-Thawri? Do you truly believe Allah loves you more than your own parents? If you truly believe that, then be comfortable with Allah as your Lord. Be comfortable with His hukum. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, there is one answer I want you to remember when Allah questions you on the day of judgment. Do you know what that answer is? When Allah brings out the books and says, Muhammad, Jazeer, so-and-so, Amir, Tawfiq, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. And he goes on for thousands of hours talking about how many sins we have done. What do you say, Tawfiq? What do you say, Amir? What do you say, Jazeer? What do you say, Muhammad? What do you say, Aisha? I want you to have one answer. You know what that answer is? Oh, Allah guilty. I acknowledge all my sins. Don't argue back. Because you know, your soul knows how much you have done. You know what you have done, my friends. Allah made our nafs enough a witness over us. We don't need anything else. We know what we have done. Oh Allah, guilty, guilty. So my brothers, my sisters in Islam, come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When was the last time you really connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When was the last time you really felt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for you. Are you working for Allah everybody? If you're working for Allah, why the heck do you think someone else is paying your salary? If you work for GE, does IBM pay your salary? If you work for GE, does IBM pay your salary? Yes or no? No! What is your problem that you think your risk is tied to this world or this dunya or this means that you have? That's it. If you're working for Allah, then Allah pays your salary. 
نَحْنُ نَرْزُكُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ Then Allah says, نَحْنُ نَرْزُكُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ How many times Allah says, نَحْنُ رَزَّاكُ We are the Razzaq, we are the Lord, we are the one who provides. If Allah, you work for Allah, then Allah provides for you, not this bloody company that you're working for. It's only a tools and a means. So why are you so afraid? Why are you afraid this world has shackled you so much because no, I have to do this. I can't do this. I have to work in this job because the job is paying my salary. It's not. It's Allah paying the salary. Still, the job is just a means for you, a tool for which your risk will come to you. By Allah, this risk would have come to you had this job not been there as well. Somehow or the other, the risk will come to you. The hands will change, that's right. But the giver is still the same. The giver is still the same. So liberate yourselves, my friends. Liberate yourselves. If you work for GE, GE pays your salary, not IBM. If you work for Allah, Allah pays your salary, not people. If you work for Allah and live for Allah, Allah will look after you, not human beings. Then liberate yourselves. Do that which is right. Work for the Akhirah and Allah will look after you by Allah. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for birds, but not in their nest. Allah provides for the birds when they fly out. We're all doing that. We're flying out. But we're forgetting who really provides. We're forgetting it is Allah who provides for the birds. And we think it is so-and-so providing. So my brothers and my sisters in Islam, liberate yourselves from the shackle of this world. Liberate yourself. The more I have liberated myself, the more wealth I have ever made. And brothers over here know my situation. I was a medical student. My fourth year, I gave it up. I have $200 only in my pocket when I went to Medina. $200. And I bought a thobe that was torn. I wish I kept that thobe. 16 riyals it cost me. It was actually 10 riyals. And I paid 6 riyals to just shorten my, the thobe a little bit. That was my only thobe that I had for 8 months. This is a student of medis, medicine who left a most lucrative degree and a lucrative job with parents who look after him to go to Medina to study there with only $200 in my pocket. I still remember I took my wife with me. Illegally I took her. Illegally I kept her. I used to live in this house that was full of rats. 500 riyals was a rent and I couldn't afford it by Allah. Because the government wasn't paying our salaries, our student stipends at that time. Because the price of oil was only $8 a barrel. Do you remember that time? $8 a barrel. It was in 1995, 1990, 1998. At that time, the price of oil was $14 a barrel, $12 a barrel. Not like it is now. $80, $90 a barrel, $60 a barrel. No, very, very less. So the first people who wouldn't get paid is us. I still remember we used to put water on the carpets and sleep on it because of the heat. We couldn't afford an air conditioner or even a fan. Water on the carpets and sleep. Imagine having a wife from Australia, grown up in Australia, who's been pampered by her parents sleeping in that sort of, sort of, sort of uh, bathroom, so, uh, sort of uh, house. We used to keep our food in our neighbor's fridge because we couldn't afford a fridge. Somehow, by someone's mercy, someone gave us an old fridge. It would break down sometimes and would be all right sometimes. But it was okay because we only had two types of food. We, we used to buy bread and we used to buy tomato sauce. We used to eat bread with tomato sauce. You know the one real bread? You get the Somali bread here, don't you? Yeah, the one real, the hot dog type of bread. And you get one real tomato sauce, right? Don't you get one real tomato sauce? One dirham? I'm sure you do. So we used to open that up, put the one real tomato sauce, and we used to eat that. Eight months we ate that. I still remember once someone came back from Australia. A Hajj came back from Australia and he bought 100 riyals with him as a gift for me. And I took that money. So amazed, I still remember. And I went to my wife and we said, let's go buy, buy a, a chicken. So we bought a chicken. SubhanAllah, I still remember. 
the chicken in front of me and my wife, 10 riyals. A lot of money for us at that time. And we ate and we ate and we ate and we ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. Like we were like eating like crazy. No one's talking, just eating. Then we looked and still half a chicken left. <laughs> still half a chicken left. And I still remember, I still remember it. Still tell my wife. We covered the chicken up. She put it away into that stupid fridge of ours. <laughs> and she looked at me and I still remember what she said. Do you know what she said? She said, do you think we could do that again next week? Subhanallah. Two years after that, the internet came to Medina. And I used to have a website called Salaf al-Saleh website, where it had a thousand pages. I mean, remember the website? Yeah. And I was the king of internet, because I knew more about internet in all of Medina than anyone else, because I did that stuff. So I took my stuff and I showed it to people. And then I made a free website for one sheikh here, one sheikh there. Then I started charging money, 2,000, 3,000 riyals. Then I got the money and straight away bought a laptop. Laptop at that time was very expensive, right guys, remember? I bought a HP laptop. Very expensive, 10,000 riyals, oh my God. Laptops at that time were disgustingly expensive. So I bought it, 10,000 riyals, I still remember it. My wife was very angry. Why we need to buy this and that? I said, don't worry, I've got a plan. So I got the laptop, made myself a business card. I started speaking only English when I went to my, my business deals. And I started charging money like crazy. How much? 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 I charge sometimes. My largest project I charged 300,000 pounds, 300,000 US dollars. It took me only about two weeks to do. Because I could charge what I wanted. And I would take money like this to my wife and you know, slap her face with it. See how it feels? My brothers and my sisters in Islam, doesn't matter. Allah will test you initially when you want to work for His cause. Do you know why He'll do that? Because Allah wants to first of all remove every asbab away from you. Allah wants to remove every single asbab away from you because He wants to show you that ultimately victory is from Allah. So initially when you start to work only for the cause of Allah, and you want to do something only for the cause of Allah, Allah gives you straight away some sort of difficulty and fakr and poverty. Why? Because He wants to remove every sabab other than Allah. Then once that's gone, then Allah's mercy comes. So you know definitely all of this is only from Allah. I was perhaps the richest student in Medina. After the Emiratis, of course, where the government pays them big bucks. But I had to earn from it. But I think I made more money than them. I had my own custom designed car. No one could beat me from the stop, stop sign. I'm a speed freak. Subhanallah, no one could beat me. I was perhaps, myself and Yasir Qadi were the only two students. We used to come to the lectures of, of our mashayikh. We would sit there and I'd say, Yasir, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to Hardy's. All right, I'll see you there. And we used to just pass by and we'd sit down there and have a, have a coffee and then we'd leave. We were perhaps the richest students there. He was to write books, I used to make websites. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, money comes to you. The provider is Allah. If Allah has written for it, money will come to you, doesn't matter where. It will come. The worst thing you could do was run after it. Worst thing you could do is work for this world. Remember you're working for Allah, Allah will provide you the money. If you're working for IBM, then IBM pays the salary, not GE. If you work for Allah, Allah provides the salary for you. Allah will provide it for you. You have to believe it. Do you truly believe you work for Allah? Ask yourself this question. Do you truly believe it in your heart? How much do you truly believe? You know, another day, a few days ago, a sheikh asked me that question. That Abu Yusuf, when you have mercy mission and al and you need money, what's your fundraising strategy, he asked me. And I said, okay, you know, we do this, we do that, we do this sort of thing and that sort of thing, we do fundraising here. And then he stopped me and he said, what about Allah? Is there actually a fundraising strategy raising your hands to Allah? And you know, subhanAllah, it's like he slapped me. He gave me a slap, Wallahi, and he taught me 
about tawakkul, a lesson that I had never ever learned before. And he told me the same thing. If you work for GE, this is his quote. He said, if you work for GE, does GE pay your salary or does IBM pay your salary? So if you work for Allah, Allah pays your salary. And then I thought about this. And I thought about how much I connect with Allah. Then I remembered my children. I have five kids, my friends. And I want to tell you how they make dua to me. Dua meaning when they ask me something. This is how they do it. Ibrahim, let me start, start off with the first one, Yusuf. Yusuf is my oldest one. I think the oldest children are always a little bit soft. Is that correct? The first child always a little bit soft. Cries a little bit. Cries too much. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't know. But I tend to find I was the oldest one. I think it was just too soft. I was just too soft. And I would just, you know, a little bit I would start crying. So Yusuf, he says, Boba, Boba, yes. Um, can I buy that thing? What is that thing? Uh, PlayStation, nice, nice game. No, Yusuf, I don't have money. And he just make his, that face of his, and he just turned away, and he just shed one or two tears, and that's it. Okay? This is how he asks me. Then comes Aisha. Aisha is my next one. She's the eldest daughter. What does she do? Boba, yes. You're very nice, Boba. And she comes, and she combs my hair, touches my head. <laughs> Wallahi, she's just such an unbelievable. Subhanallah, she's going to get everything from her husband. Anyway. <laughs> Mashallah, she does everything, touches me, so Boba, how are you Boba? Can I do anything for you? Like a glass of water, like some juice? How about that? And she takes, takes my shoes off. Aisha, what do you want? <laughs> Boba, can I get that present from there? No, not now, I don't have money. Okay, Boba, that's fine. Then she does go away nicely. Then comes Zainab. Look at how she makes dua to me. Make, ask me something. What does she do? What does she do? She says, Boba, 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 yes, um, 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 there's that really nice toy um, I saw there. Can I please have it, please, 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 please. This is, she's a really funny girl, right? Like that. She's seven years old, and this is how she asks me. And I said, no, Zainab, okay. And then she just goes away, right? Then this is Ibrahim. Ibrahim doesn't talk. He just smiles. So Boba, yes. <laughs> All he does is smile, and I know he's up to something naughty. Okay? Just a smile. I say, Ibrahim, no. Okay. And he's still smiling and going away. Then the last one. Maryam. How does she ask? Three years old. Huh? No, no, no. Who do you think is successful? Who do you think is successful? Best negotiator. Who is it? Last one. She gets it all the time. Because if she doesn't, she's going to kill me. She won't shut up. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. Why can't we ask Allah like a two-year-old child? Why can't we ask Allah and make dua to Allah like that? Why? And I thought about this, look at how she gets everything from me all the time. When Allah loves that I make dua, the Prophet said, Allah loves it when you make dua, Allah hates it when you don't make dua. The Prophet also said in the authentic hadith, Ma a'azzu shay'an ala Allahi, ma akramu shay'an ala Allahi min dua There is nothing more honorable to Allah than dua. The Prophet also said in the authentic hadith in Muslim, he said, A'ajazu nas a'ajazuhum anid dua the most incompetent of people are those people who are not even capable of making dua. Why can't we ask Allah like a two-year-old child? Oh Allah, oh Allah, you are the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Oh Allah, you are the richest and I'm the poor. Oh Allah, I don't want to put my hands down until you answer my dua. Oh Allah, don't put my hands down until you answer my dua. Oh Allah, I beseech you, oh Allah. Oh Allah, I need your help, oh Allah. Allah, Allah give me Jannah. Oh Allah, don't punish me in Jahannam. Oh Allah, let me see your face. Oh Allah, right from me, safety from the fire today. Oh Allah, don't let me put my hands down until you answer my dua. Oh Allah, I'm not going to put my hands down 
until you answer my dua. Do you know what the Prophet said? He said, Allah is ashamed, authentic hadith in Muslim. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ashamed of his slaves when he raises his hands up to him to return it back sifra. Inna Allah la yastahi min abdihi idha rafa ilayhi yadayhi an yaruddahu sifra. Allah is ashamed of his slave when his slave raises his hands up to him to return it back to him empty. Subhanallah, how amazing is that? Allah is ashamed. What an honorable king. What an honorable judge. What an honorable Lord he is. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, ask Allah like a two-year-old child. Ask Allah like a two-year-old child, you will have everything you want. Ask Allah like you never asked before. Don't make like, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirat hasanatan wa kina adhaban naar. Ameen. Wa fil jannati ma'al abrar. Ameen. What the heck are you saying? You don't even know. It's like, you know, Zainab comes to me. Please, 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 please. Can I have it? No. So they said, then you go away. Is this the way? This isn't the way. If Zainab only persisted, if Yusuf only persisted, if Ibrahim only persisted, if Aisha only persisted, they would get their way. But they didn't. Neither do we. We are far too hasty, my friends. Allah sometimes doesn't answer our dua directly. You know why? Because He loves to make us make dua. He loves to hear us beseeching Him and making dua to Him. He loves it. That's why He waits, 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 waits before He answers it. Because He knows you're going to stop making dua as soon as you get your thing. So my friends, connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is your chance. Nothing as strong as dua. Nothing is as strong as dua. Nothing is as strong as dua. Do you know how many verses in the Quran against making dua to other than Allah? How many verses? 500 verses. Wala tadu'u ma'allahi ilahan akhar. 500 verses like this. Inna alladhina tadu'una min dunillahi. How many verses are like that? 500 verses of not making dua to anyone other than Allah. Do you know why? Because the scholars say that dua is the best of ibadah. Because Rasulullah said, dua mukhul ibadah. Dua is the heart and soul of ibadah. Heart and soul of worship. And the thing that is common between all religions is dua. It's not salah or zakat. It's dua. Christians make dua to Allah, to their gods. Jews make dua. Even Hindus make dua. So the common ibadah that is common to all religions is dua. So the greatest act of ibadah is dua. Dua is more stronger than sujood as well, as the scholars say. How? Well, because in sujood, you're making tawheed uluhiya. But in dua, you make tawheed rububiya and uluhiya and asma sifat. How is that? Allahumma anta rabbi. Oh Allah, you are my Lord. Khalaqtani. This is tawheed rububiya. It is only you that we worship and it is only that you that we seek help. And you're raising of, of, your, of your hands to Allah. This is Tawheed Uluhiyya. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Ya Qawi, Ya Aziz, Ya Mateen, Ya Jabbar. Ya Dhal Jalal, you claim this is the names of Allah. This is Tawheed Asma Sifat. So can you see how you're joining all the elements of Tawheed in Dua? Can you see that? In the same way, you can make shirk in all of these things. And this is why shirk in dua is the worst of shirk. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, connect and come back to Allah with dua. This is the month of dua. This is the month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not reject our dua, one dua every single day. What dua have you made for today? And have you been hasty in your dua? Or are you truly making dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you should? Like the two-year-old child. Beg Allah, Allah will not say no to you. Beg Allah, Allah will not say no to you. How many hadith do we have where the Prophet ﷺ would say that? In an authentic hadith in Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, and there was a quote in, in, the, in Sahih Muslim about a boy who was a shepherd. And he was a young boy and he was a shepherd 
and his sheep were dying because it was very dry. So he raised up his hands and the Prophet said, this boy raised up his hands and he made dua to Allah. And he said, Oh Allah, I am not going to put my hands down until you answer my dua, Ya Rabbi. Oh Allah, my sheep are dying. Oh Allah, only you can save them. Oh Allah, give us rain. And so it started to rain. It started to rain until, until, he gave his, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua. Why could we not also do the same? My friends, if you truly believe Allah exists, if we truly believe we work for Allah, then you have a direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you make dua to Allah, Allah remembers you to himself. If you remember Allah, Allah remembers you to himself. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he says, if there was only one verse that was revealed that could show you the greatness of dua, then this verse would be enough. Which dua, which verse is that? فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, I will remember you. Yes, salam. How powerful. Allah will remember you despite all of the affairs of the universe that He is looking after. Allah will mention you to a gathering far better than the gathering you're mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, now was the time to connect with Allah. A time in which by Allah, you are all focused on your deen. Now is the time to come back to Allah Azawajal. Ask Allah for Jannah, He will give it to you. Ask Allah for good in this dunya and the akhirah, Allah will give it to you. Ask Allah from your heart, not your tongues. Ask Allah. You know many people, they try to be very poetic in their dua. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسْنًا فِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسْنًا وَقِنَا ذَابَ النَّارِ وَفِي الْجَنَّةِ مَعَا الْأَبْرَارِ You know, they try to be really poetic. Ibn Qudama rahimullah says in Mughni, to be poetic in, a, in your dua intentionally is makruh, is disliked. Why is that? Because you're concentrating more on the words rather than on connecting with Allah in your heart. Does that make sense? And that's the mushkila with people who just do dua without it coming from the heart. And you can tell when it comes from the heart when a person can't find the words. When you can't find the words, that's when it's coming from your qalb, the deepest part of your soul. So ask Allah in a way that by Allah, only Allah knows what's in your heart. So my brothers and sisters Islam, in conclusion, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us of His punishment. At the same time to remind us of His beautiful justice and His mercy. And I ask everyone to remember one name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know which name it is? It's the name called Al-Wadud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Wadud. And what is the meaning of Al-Wadud? Al-Wadud is the loving God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his, his creation. Al-Wadud is a loving God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his creation. The Prophet sallallahu once saw a, a woman running, looking after her child. Where is the child? Where is the child? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Suddenly finds the child and hugs the child, kisses the child like, like he's found this, this baby that has been lost for so long. Quickly gives the child something to drink from her breast and caresses the child like this. Can you imagine that mother? And the Prophet said, Wallahi, inna Allah, verily Allah is more merciful, more loving to his slave than this mother to her, to her child. Ya Ikhwa, Allah is waiting for us to come to Him. Allah is waiting for us to come to Him. Fafirru ilallah. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't ever be afraid of anything. Don't ever be shackled by anything. Remember, if you work for Allah, Allah gives the money, not your, not your business. Your business is just a means for it too. So give and don't care. Give and don't care. Work for Allah and don't care. Money will come. You are an intelligent human being. Money will come whichever way you, you do it. Wealth will come. Just work for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu would tell Bilal, who had very little money, Ya Bilal, anfiq, O Bilal, give. Wala taqsha min dhil arshi iqlala. And do not be wary that the one who possesses the throne will ever withhold from you. So do not ever be wary, my friends, that if you work for the cause of Allah, then ultimately by Allah, 
that he will ever withhold from you. Allah is a possessor of the throne. If we all got together and asked Allah for everything in this world, he would not take away from the kingdom of Allah, not even anything at all. As like that needle dropped into the ocean, how much does it take out? That's it. So my friends, ask and Allah will give. Ask and Allah will connect with you. Ask and Allah will save you from the fire. And if this is your last Ramadan, the best thing you can do is to connect with Allah Azawajal, become his friend by constantly remembering him, constantly coming back to him, constantly thinking about him, constantly keeping your tongue moist with Allah and his remembrance and dua. That's it. Oh Allah, oh Allah, have a conversation with Allah. And may this be your greatest deed upon which you pass away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.